All right, everybody, this is episode 26 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, CH. Today we are going to do chapter three of 21 Lessons uh, by Dare GG. If you haven't uh, checked out 21lessons.com yet, definitely go take a look. Uh, and you can listen to this entire uh, article, which was read by Guy Swan from the Crypto Economy podcast. So big shout out to Guy for going ahead and doing that. It is a very valuable piece of content that um, needed to be in podcast form. So we've already covered chapters one and chapter two in the last two episodes of the podcast, just trying to talk about the philosophy of Bitcoin and the economics of Bitcoin. Uh, and now, chapter three, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology of Bitcoin. So again, if you have not checked out 21lessons.com yet, definitely go check that out after listening to this. We'll do a quick um, 15, 20 minutes going through um, the, last, the last chapter of this, and then uh, let's jump right in. Strength in numbers, lesson 15. So lesson 15 talks about a lot of the cryptography related to Bitcoin. And it goes over uh, why the system is secure and that having a uh, a money-based system that is secured by math is uh, is very important because it helps to minimize the trust necessary um, to use the system. So I don't need to do anything too crazy or ask anybody if, if uh, to validate if these coins are actually mine or, or not counterfeit. And the system does that on its own, which is, which is great. And that's one of the reasons why um, encryption software is such a good enabler of freedom, privacy, and, uh, and other technologies. So the, the SHA-256 is a hash function that's used in Bitcoin. <clears throat> And it's very strong and very secure. And uh, the reason that it's used is because it's extremely difficult to brute force it and um, let's say generate the private keys from the from the public key, as an example. So that means if someone were to have access to your public address and they knew that uh, you know that point one BTC that's in there is yours, they couldn't point computational power or resources at it and then crack the, the public key to get the private key, right? So that wouldn't be possible to do today uh, because the cryptography involved is, is so strong. And then I wanted to read a quote here. Definitely check out this video is uh, how secure is 256 bit security. Um, that might help you wrap your head around kind of the numbers that are involved here in securing um, what's what, what's securing your money, pretty much. These numbers have nothing to do with the technology of the device of the devices. They are the maximums that thermo that thermodynamics will allow, and they strongly impro- imply that brute force attacks against 256 bit keys will be infeasible until computers are built from something other than matter and occupy something other than space. So pretty much what he's saying there is um, the encryption's pretty fucking strong, basically. Um, you would need a significant amount of computational um, resources that probably don't even exist today um, that you would need to go ahead and and brute force um, the the cryptography that's that's securing your money and that's that's securing Bitcoin Um, and I think it was also a pretty good point here um, that you are secured by that that five dollar there's also the option of the global five dollar wrench attack so somebody can come and say you know, with a gun or a $5 wrench and say, you know, give me all your Bitcoin. And you can either, you know, do that or not. Um, But the point is that someone can't go and take your Bitcoin without you voluntarily giving up access to your private keys. So again, that encryption is really protecting you in every circumstance except for you being forced to give up your private key to someone else, uh, whether it be through the threat of violence um, or or whatever. So I think that's really important to, that you have that 
sleep at night insurance that the only way someone's taking your private private keys is by force. Other than that, it will be extremely difficult to um, to get their hands on your private keys. So definitely, uh, you know, come back through, listen to this section, read it a couple times. Um, it's uh, it can be a little intimidating if you're if you're getting new to uh, cryptography and and more about how Bitcoin works, but it's absolutely worth worth going through. Let's jump to lesson 16. Don't trust, verify. This is a common quote in the Bitcoin space because uh, that is kind of the name of the game. With, with Bitcoin, you don't need to trust anyone if you don't want to. You are free to um, verify every transaction on the network yourself and you don't have to rely on any third parties to give you um, correct or accurate information. You can do it yourself. And uh, I want to read this quote from Satoshi. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that is required to make it work. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust. So Satoshi solved the Byzantine general's problem with uh, Nakamoto consensus, which was a very difficult computer science problem um, that that basically uh, is involved with the double spend problem. So how do you know and trust that um, if you were to send a message to a group of individuals that it wasn't changed on the way to um, to being delivered to the person getting it. So how can you ensure that everyone is on the same page, basically? And, um, you know, proof of work w was probably the key innovation there that allowed for trust to be minimized in such a way where that everyone can be on um, the same ledger. And we'll talk about that in, in one, of the other, one of the other lessons. But it's also important to know that... Um, you can now perform that trust function on your own by running a full node, and it's not very expensive to do. So if you were to compare running a gold full node, that would be super expensive. If you had to verify and validate every single transaction for gold, um, you'd have to um, melt the gold down and, and then recast it just to be 100% positive that it, is, that it is pure gold and not um, counterfeit. And now you can run a, a Bitcoin full node on a cell phone. You can run it on a little Android TV box. Um, or you can get one of the node at home, node in a box, like the Casa node or the Noddle. So it's very easy to perform that trust function in a way that's also um, much cheaper than ever before. Definitely go through and 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 uh, read all of the "Don't Trust Verify" section. It's important to um, to really get this part um, because this is the ethos of, of of Bitcoin. You know, open source. Don't trust anybody um, and verify everything for yourself. Or at the very least, if you're not super technical find people that you trust that you believe are technical enough to at least guide you down the right path and make sure um, there is a a you, you trust their verification of what's going on but it is always worth the time and effort and responsibility to look into these things yourself even if it's um, figuring out how to check pgp keys um, for uh, maybe a developer who uh, is working on a particular wallet software or whatever. It's good practice to get used to that. Okay, let's move on to lesson 17. Telling time takes work. So now we're getting more into the, the Bitcoin clock of sorts. And um, this has a lot to do with maybe even reframing Bitcoin as a time chain rather than a blockchain. So we always like to think of uh, Bitcoin as a, as a chain of blocks, right? A blockchain. And it seems as though as everyone's understanding of Bitcoin starts to change, we realize that 
it might be more of a time chain instead. So it's a time stamping protocol that's backed by math and energy where the order of such transactions is extremely important. So every 10 minutes when a new block is added to the time chain, um, you can see what the UTXO set is at that time, all the transactions that happened between the last block and the new block, and uh, which private keys now have the ability to spend um, the coins that have moved in the last block. So, um, but the time chain portion is very important because everybody needs to be on the same page at the same time. And that's actually a reason why the 10 minutes in between blocks is probably a, a long enough period of time to let um, blocks propagate across the network um, to all of the nodes so that way everyone can be on the same page in a reasonable amount of time. But say you had a block time that was much faster, it would um, be much more difficult for that information to flow across the entire network very quickly so that everyone could get on the same page. So um, although I, I'm not sure if Satoshi chose a 10 minute block time on purpose or if it was just you know a random number that he plugged in and said, all right, 10 minutes sounds good enough to me, but I'd say it, it's certainly looking like it worked out pretty well because it's, um, it's just enough time to make sure that there aren't too many reorgs um, and that everyone who's running a node has plenty of time for um, the blocks to propagate across the network so that everyone can then be on the same page. I wanted to read another quick section here. Proof of work is a system in which everyone can validate what happened and in what order it happened. This independent validation is what leads to consensus, an individual agreement by multiple parties about who owns what. And that's pretty much what, what we just went over here. Um, <clears throat> proof of work is the innovation that allows that to happen. And the distributed and decentralized nature of Bitcoin gives us a, a consistent way to tell the time and to have a very accurate account of who has what. That requires no trust, no double checking for from anybody else to make sure you can validate what property is yours. And I think that's truly unbelievable. And we're really just starting to see the beginnings of what can be enabled by having this immutable and decentralized time chain. Uh, I think we're going to see some pretty some pretty wild shit in in the decades to come. And here's another quote by Satoshi: "The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain, which serves as proof of the sequence of events witnessed." So there you go. All right. And then <laughs> Dare Gigi says, Bitcoin taught me that telling time is tricky, especially if you are decentralized. Uh, I couldn't have said it, couldn't have said it better myself. All right, let's move on to lesson 18. Move slowly and don't break things. Um, if you like to read or listen to any Silicon Valley type um, entrepreneurial books or startup books, you're going to hear that move fast and break things quote probably hundreds of times. And while that's all fine and good when you're building um, maybe commercial or retail products and you are trying to figure out the best way to um, solve a problem for your customer and you want to iterate very fast and and figure out the best way to solve that problem in the most efficient way possible you want to move fast and break things but when you're dealing with global money on an open source network you definitely do not want to move fast and break things um, and the break things part is probably the most important there while I have no issues with moving fast and I think Bitcoin development is moving at lightning speed um, from what I can understand of people who have been in this space since almost the beginning. They did not think we would be here uh, technically with things like lightning and, and side chains and, and um, 
writing proposals to implement Schnorr signatures into into Bitcoin Core. Um, so I think we're moving way faster than anyone could have imagined, but it also doesn't f- seem fast enough. And I think the reason why it doesn't feel fast enough is because you have a lot of the ICO boom and the shitcoin boom of people saying all the things that Bitcoin can't do. Um, and so, you know, buy my token instead because we can we can do this one tiny little use case that um, doesn't need its own token and will eventually be built onto Bitcoin. Anyway, um, it's just important to um, understand that things take time and that the internet took many decades to get from um, different universities sending messages back and forth across the country to now every single person pretty much having a cell phone and having internet access and can communicate freely with anyone on the globe. It took a long time to go from a few computers in the United States to a cell phone in every pocket with internet access. And I think that it's already been 10 years for Bitcoin and that the next 10 are going to feel way faster than the previous 10 because Bitcoin is such an exponential technology and you're starting to see um, new frameworks and infrastructure being built and, uh, and worked on now, such as Lightning Network as an example. I like to think of Lightning Network almost like uh, the web. So as soon as um, web pages were born, that was kind of the the spark that was needed to start enabling all the use cases that um, we would then see throughout the decades to come, right? And now you're seeing that with with Lightning, you can you can build certain things that were not possible to build before, and that has tremendous consequences because it can allow you to it can allow developers and entrepreneurs to build things very quickly while making sure that the base layer of Bitcoin is secure, that that won't break, and they can go ahead and experiment on top of Lightning and try to build new products and use cases um, that everyone can can test out, and they won't need any permission to do so. So I think that's um, that's important to to think about. And I want to read this quote from Satoshi. A lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed in the 90s. I hope it's obvious it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. Um, That's a very wise quote from from Satoshi. Um, It's really important to uh, protect your privacy, and I think we're going to talk about that one in in the next um, in the next lesson, but. It's that central point of failure had kind of made all of those electronic currency um, ideas kind of dead on arrival because you can just go and, and shut it down. There's somebody to go to to um, stop the problem and you know take that take that offline for lack of a better term. And that's why decentralization is pretty important with Bitcoin because there's no just like we're seeing with the um, Libra, Facebook coin, and, and, and governments getting more, um, asking a lot more questions about what they're trying to do, they can just send Mark Zuckerberg a letter and say, hey, you know, cut it out. There's there's nobody to do, to do that with, with Bitcoin. I mean, you just can't. Satoshi is anonymous. He's not even around anymore. Um, and you're kind of, you're, you're stuck with this decentralized, uh, global money system that you can run on a cell phone, and it's it's almost unbelievable when you really sit down and and think about it. Um, I think there was one more quote here that I wanted to yes from Satoshi. So being open source means anyone can independently review the code. If it was closed source, nobody could verify the security. I think it's essential for a program of this nature to be open source. Uh, And Satoshi definitely nailed it there. And to get back to moving slowly and and not breaking things, it's good to have a lot of eyes on the code, um, especially when you're talking about a global money system. Um, You want as many brilliant eyes as possible on it so that they can make sure the 
software is secure, it's running properly, and it's free of bugs. And if there are issues, it can be addressed um, quickly without um, giving too much exposure to things like a catastrophic issue, right? So, and I think um, one of my predictions is that many of the 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 next Amazons of the world, the the businesses that will be built on top of Bitcoin, will the majority will be open source, and I think. When you see things like the Wasabi Wallet, right? So Wasabi Wallet is a desktop wallet that allows um, users to coin join their UTXOs. Um, and in other words, they can um, send them into a mixer with other uh, people who are using the Wasabi Wallet, and it mixes all the coins together, and then you, you know, it spits back out uh, the coins to you. But and when you look at those on a block explorer, you can't tell where they're coming from at all. So, you, you know, it, it really breaks a lot of the heuristics around what chain analysis companies are doing. So it, it, it makes um, a lot of those assumptions just completely worthless. And the way that Wasabi Wallet monetizes is they take a very, very small percentage of the Anana an anonymity set that is applied to um, your coin join mix. So if it is, you know, super duper private, it'll cost you, um, you know, 0.01% or, or whatever. I'm just throwing numbers out there. Those aren't exact. Um, but the code is open source, right? So everybody can go and look at it and make sure that Wasabi isn't, you know, taking a few Satoshis on the side in addition to the fee um, every time you're running a coin join, right? So they, it's difficult because you need to figure out a way to monetize what you're doing, your business, but also keep it open source because users are demanding that almost. Nobody's going to trust a wallet that is closed source anymore. I mean, this is Bitcoin we're talking about. Um, all of the All of the hacks that we've seen in the last 10 years have made people pretty skeptical of almost anything that is closed source. So you really, it's advantageous to be open source. The tricky part is um, defending your turf, right? So anybody can go in and fork the Wasabi code and just kind of launch their own little wallet and start making fees as well. And I think, I have a feeling that's just the way things are, are gonna go. You're gonna have to compete and fight, make it open source, and your product's going to need to be the absolute best at what it does. And I also think that's a really great way for wallets to monetize. So let's say you use Samurai Wallet on Android and it's been a big question, like how how do wallets monetize? You know, what does that look like? Well, I think if you offer different features in the wallet that you can um, ethically and appropriately charge for, it makes a lot of sense. So if you have anonymity features or coin join functionality that um, in order to use them you pay a small percentage fee of um, the of the mixing service that's very under understandable I can get that um, it's not subscription based um, it's almost like a freemium model right you can use the samurai wallet for free it doesn't cost you anything but if you want to use the um, some of the privacy features, it's going to cost you a little bit, but it's almost so negligible that you might not even notice. Um, so I think the the low cost, high volume model for, for wallets will be very interesting um, because it's kind of low friction and a great way to monetize and stay open source. Um, so I think that's I think that's pretty important. And it's it's a good thing to kind of wrap your head around why it's important to not move fast and break things. So if you're, if you're still not really sure that, um, if you should be holding other coins and that you think other coins will have all these other features that will, you know, kind of make Bitcoin irrelevant, um, really take the time to go through this because it's important that you understand, um, the security implications involved with, with making sure that this kind of network and distributed system does not break. Okay, let's move on to lesson 19. Privacy is not dead. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting topic because um, I'd say in the last decade or so, people have not been taking their privacy 
that seriously at all, and myself included. There are many different social media sites where you're putting all of your information out there, pictures, videos, messages, um, you know, the times and locations of the different places that you were at. Um, all of that information is being logged, saved, stored, and um, can potentially be used against you in the court of law for, um, for whatever reason. Um, and for better or for worse, it's important to start taking your, um, your online privacy very seriously and uh, making sure you have good digital hygiene, as I've heard a few people say. Um, and that's something that I want to start talking about more on the podcast because I did not take my privacy as seriously as I should have. And, and Bitcoin being the good teacher that is, that it is, is teaching me that it's um, a good idea to take that digital hygiene much, much more seriously. And, um, I mean, Satoshi kind of said it without saying it. He used a pseudonym and was remained anonymous for a reason, right? Um, when you, if you come up with a genius idea of how to make a workable digital cash, you might not want to put your name on it because um, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to want to have a conversation with you about what you're trying to do here. Uh, also, uh, there's an Edward Snowden quote here: "Encryption works. Properly in implemented, strong crypto systems are one of the few things you can rely on, and we can rely on them based upon um, the math that is." Um, used in these cryptographic systems. And if you haven't gotten a chance to listen to the uh, Edward Snowden 30-minute um, talk from Bitcoin 2019 conference, definitely uh, definitely go check that out. It's on it's on Google. A few different people have have put it up. I was there uh, in person and got to got to see the whole Snowden talk and it it was really good. It was really good. Uh, really great talks about privacy and freedom and all the things that are just so nicely aligned with Bitcoin. I highly recommend. Um, I highly recommend watching it or listening to it. it. It's it's great. Okay, let's move on to lesson twenty. <clears throat> Cypherpunks write code. This is an interesting one and. Uh, if you haven't read the Cypherpunk Manifesto, I definitely recommend that. So go out and use DuckDuckGo and, and search for the Cypherpunk Manifesto and read that. It, it's pretty short. Um, it's worth thinking about and understanding what the Cypherpunks were talking about and thinking about so long ago and how critical they thought that it was. And we're just starting to see that manifest now today in in something like Bitcoin. And there has been so many other technologies that have happened throughout the, the decades that have brought us to this point in time. So it's important to kind of understand what they were thinking at the time and, and see how um, things are kind of playing out now. And I want to read this um, these few quotes from Eric Hughes. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Since we desire privacy, we must ensure that each party to a transaction have knowledge only of what of that which is directly necessary for that transaction. Therefore, privacy in an open society requires anonymous transaction systems. Until now, cash has been the primary such system. An anonymous transaction system is not a secret transaction system. We the cypherpunks are dedicated to building anonymous systems. We are defending our privacy with cryptography with anonymous mail forwarding system, with digital signatures, and with electronic money. Cypherpunks write code. Eric Hughes. Uh, that's a great quote, and I think it's important to understand that the cypherpunks take code, cypherpunks write code kind of mantra is all about taking action. And... Um, there was something I was listening to a few weeks ago <clears throat> that was talking about this and how it's much, you know, it's easy to sit back and say, oh, you know, the world should be like this, or I don't like those politics, or I don't like that piece of legislation, and, <clears throat> you know, we need to change it. Somebody needs to do something. Well, that somebody is you, all right? Now, when you think about it from a cypherpunk standpoint, um, if you come to the realization, oh, you know what? You know what's going to solve 
a lot of our problems here if we had a um, digital cash system where the money could not be coerced by um, <clears throat> uh, central banks, politicians, um, governments, etc. So we don't need to go and lobby around or set up card tables and try to convince everyone that we need to move to a, a different system of money. You just build a new system of money, you put it out on the internet, out into the wild, and see if it grows. And that's exactly what happened with Bitcoin. Nobody asked or tried to convince anybody else to use Bitcoin. Satoshi wrote the code, sent it out on a mailing list, asked people what they thought, and people started using it. Hal Finney stepped up and said, yeah, let's give this a shot. Received the first coins from Satoshi. And then here we are 10 years later. It's worth $11,000 today in July 2019. Um, and it was nothing more than, than you know, words in an email at one point and, and code on Satoshi's computer. Uh, I mean, it's truly unbelievable how if you want something to change, you need to take action and go and fix it and provide a solution that the market wants. Uh, and that was a big lesson for me because there's a lot of things that you can say you don't like about maybe the place that you live um, or the way people act. And, you know, there's a reason for all of that. But going around and trying to verbally convince everyone or make an argument for some things to change is just not realistic. You need to come up with solutions and from what I'm starting to understand now, uh, and one of the reasons why I'm trying to teach myself how to code is that uh, if you want to solve a problem, you kind of just need to code it up yourself and, and see if it works and then get feedback from other people and, and put it out into the wild. Uh, that's a good, profitable way to solve problems, uh, not complaining about it or you know, writing letters to somebody telling them to change. Uh, it's just it's not a good use of your time. So... If you're listening to this now, um, maybe think about it. Think about you know signing up for Code Academy or, or or teaching yourself a little Python or whatever language you want, and try to try to write a little bit of code to solve a personal problem that you have, and see how that see how that works, see how that makes a difference. You know they say what um, necessity is the mother of invention, so you know <laughs> the human race needed Bitcoin and. Um, they had to figure out a way how to do it and make it decentralized enough, um, distributed enough and secure enough that it couldn't be coerced by any one party. And that's kind of what you're seeing play out now. And it's, it's really awesome to watch. Uh, what, one other thing on, uh, on this a quote from Satoshi, I had to write all the code before I could convince myself that I could solve every problem. Then I wrote the paper. Um, so it's a common misconception that Satoshi wrote the white paper and then um, wrote the code after the fact. He wrote the code first, figured out that, you know, here's a list of the problems that needed to be solved and I, I know that they can be solved by all of this code, then wrote the paper. Um, it's something to keep in mind because you'll hear people try to use Satoshi to shill um, other coins and, uh, you can definitely go back and read everything Satoshi's ever written and, and you'd have a really good sense of the kind of person that Satoshi was. So you can, you can take that on for yourself for sure. Okay, last lesson, 21. Metaphors for Bitcoin's future. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, uh, you know, Bitcoin is an exponential technology. And if you're watching this on um, the video version of this, there's a chart here that has the kind of the chart of S curves of adoption of um, technology adoption in US households. So you can see, you know, vacuums, refrigeration, the internet, washing machines, computers, smartphones, tablets. And they all have this progression where they're starting from 0% all the way at the bottom. And then as time moves on, um, they start becoming adopted. And it's a 100% chart. So you know, you have that S curve where it starts to gradually go up and then it kind of takes off exponentially and then it plateaus as it's um, been adopted by um, the majority of people in, a, in an economy, right? So if you look all the way to the right side of the, of the chart, you can see things like tablets, smartphones, computers 
really just took off, right? It only took a few years for them to um, be in the early adopter phase and then boom, they just start becoming instantly adopted. And the question you need to ask yourself is, where does Bitcoin fall on this um, adoption scale? Um, and, you know, it's it's talked about that, you know, Bitcoin could be a hundred year long experiment, that it could take a super long time to be adopted globally as money by the majority of the people who have um, access to the internet. Um, it seems a little long to me, but um, I think as you have the new infrastructure being built on top of Bitcoin, you can see that spread, you can see that start to spread very quickly. And the reason I think that is because, um, one, the internet al already exists, and two, the majority of um, people who would be a user of Bitcoin already have cell phones. Um, even in some of the um, most impoverished places on the planet, um, there are there are cell phones and access to the internet. So I think you're gonna see Bitcoin really start to take off from an adoption standpoint uh, somewhere in the in the next decade uh, as soon as the iPhone moment happens for Bitcoin and whether that's an application whether that is a realization of the store of value use case that that Bitcoin provides um, I don't know if that means other countries would have to start suffering from hyperinflation with their currencies or see a, another global recession, um, which it certainly seems like we're on the cusp of, uh, of that. Um, maybe those would be the catalyst to Bitcoin being adopted um, quicker and more globally by many people who are looking to store their wealth through time. And that also has a lot to do with the price driving adoption because if Bitcoin was worth a hundred bucks per coin right now, nobody would give a shit. Um, there wouldn't be a futures market trading, a regulator f regulated futures market trading for CME. Um, BitMEX would not exist, right? There would be all these things that we wouldn't have because the price is just too low. It, there's there's not a big enough market, um, and I know that price drives adoption because when I was getting into the space, price was absolutely the driver for me. You know, you're seeing Bitcoin go up in price week after week, day after day, and you're like, whoa, I need to, you know, I need to figure out what's going on here. And I was actually talking with a buddy of mine who said, no, no, we, you know, it needs to be slower, more progressive, gradual. And that lack of volatility will not cause the, the hype cycles that we see every few years. You need that, that explosion in price to wake up the minds of uh, the people who are thinking about using it and speculating on it as a store of value. Um, and, you know, to be clear, that's what everyone's doing right now, right? They're speculating on Bitcoin's use case as a store of value. It's limited in supply. It is secure. Um, it can't be confiscated. And these are the things you might want in a good money. And when you take a deeper dive into monetary history, you can start to learn of the different flaws that monies have had over time. And you realize with gold, one of the main issues was that it wasn't super divisible. So you needed to have coinage or, or paper receipts built on top of gold as a, like a layer two technology. But that leads to its own set of problems because then you have um, people who can then inflate the supply of that by issuing more paper uh, receipts than you actually have in gold sitting back in the vaults. And the vaults are another problem because gold needs to be centralized enough in order to scale on top of it. So those are kind of a few security flaws in gold that make it um, a, a great money, but not the best money. And and Bitcoin kind of solves a few of those problems in a, in a different way and arguably a, a much better way. And it's a much more secure money. So you can see how something that serves a function much better than its predecessor can be adopted that much quicker. And since we're all con connected now globally, you can see that process start to happen much faster. And uh, 
I really think the next the next decade will be truly unbelievable with the adoption of of Bitcoin and all of the new use cases that it enables that just were not possible beforehand. And as you you can also think about you know Bitcoin and money as like the ultimate network effect, right? Um, the internet's so useful because every other person is using it. There aren't more than one internet. Um, and, and money's very similar. It works best when everyone's using it and accepting it. So if I fly to a different country and they accept Bitcoin, like that's great. Uh, I, can, I can pay with Bitcoin. They can perform economic calculation much easier. Uh, I don't have to worry about the increased friction of changing from one currency to the next to then pay for, for goods and services. Um, so that network effect of money is massive. That's why many people accept dollars in other places in the world, because dollars are useful. That's the current unit of account that we have today, which is fine. Um, I don't think it will be the unit of account forever. And we're, we're starting to see that as more and more people want to be paid in Bitcoin and, uh, and use Bitcoin. There's also uh, there's a link to a TED Talk from Jeff Bezos, and he's kind of using electricity as a metaphor for the web and f- for the internet. And I think it's important to think about Bitcoin as one of these kind of zero to one technologies similar to electricity or the internet where, you know, once you had electricity, you can then do all of these other things now that you have electricity, all these new use cases, infrastructure, um, businesses, whatever, all of these things become possible as soon as you have access to electricity. So you needed that, that, um, that innovation of electricity to then enable all these other things. And the internet is exactly the same way. You needed the internet to exist and then have other things built on top of the internet. And now every business on the planet uses the internet to to conduct their business and we all communicate using the internet. Um, and I can see Bitcoin being very similar, um, like a pre Bitcoin world and a post Bitcoin world. Um, it's an enabling technology, which can enable things that we can't even think about or predict right now. Um, just like if it were, uh, in the early nineties and I said, yeah, you know, we'll probably all have this thing in our pocket, um, which we'll be able to, um, watch our favorite TV shows and videos on in a very high quality and we'd be able to use it to take high quality pictures and videos and we could use it to uh, do video messages across the globe and you can even use it to um, to call a car and a taxi to come and pick you up and take you wherever you wanted to go. If you were to say that to someone 20 years ago, they would have thought you were insane um, because you would have been insane. It just wasn't possible before, but system scale and technology gets better and people are working on these difficult problems. Um, and, and Bitcoin can be one of those great game changing fundamental pieces of technology that um, just lead to a much more prosperous society in the future. And uh, I think it's important to go back and understand the similarities between Bitcoin and the internet because uh, just as the the internet was becoming mainstream you know it was for pornographers and it was for criminals and it was for all the bad people Um, and now you do your banking on the internet and you don't even think twice about it you know it took a long time for some people to even want to put their credit card on the internet because it was open and public and you know not secure and uh, and now Everything is done on the internet. And it's the same thing you hear with Bitcoin, right? You have um, people saying Bitcoin's just for criminals and, and that's the only reason that it's um, being used, which is you know complete nonsense. Most criminals use the, the US dollar as their currency of choice. Um, and the amount of criminal activity going on with Bitcoin is very, very, very low. If anything, it's um, the use case is hodling and, um, and building new technologies, um, very little criminal activity, but you can, you can see these same things. You know, they said you could never stream high quality video over the internet because it just wasn't possible. The bandwidth made it impossible. And now we can do that. You can stream it on your 
<laughs> on your cell phone. I mean, for the people saying, oh, you know, fees are too high or, or Bitcoin's too slow, they're really just not thinking clearly about it. They're assuming that Bitcoin can never change or it won't be different than, than what it is today. When you know, people are lose, using things like the Lightning Network all the time. You have uh, businesses like BitRefill who are having um, more payments accepted with Lightning than they are with on-chain Bitcoin. Um, and there's probably a chance where you're going to listen to this and you might not even know the difference between um, off-chain and on-chain Bitcoin because it's just going to be abstracted away in the background and you'd never even know the difference. Uh, so these are the kind of things that we're talking about when trying to analogize for Bitcoin. It, it's really almost impo impossible because um, we've never had decentralized digital scarcity before. I mean, it just period. So the repercussions of that are huge. And um, we won't know what those are, or what they will be until, until they kind of get here. And I think that's, um, that's a really good way to think about it, that it is so early for Bitcoin, and it is so early for all of you who are um, sitting here thinking about Bitcoin stacking sats for the future, um, looking forward to all the things that are going to happen. Um, I think it's it's just a great time to be into Bitcoin right now. So much is changing, uh, so much is happening, and uh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome ride. So I definitely want to recommend checking out uh, 21lessons.com by Dare Gigi. Uh, we thank him for all of the hard work and all of the articles that he's written and for putting it into this awesome, um, highly digestible format. Also check out Bitcoin Resources. Uh, I think that's bitcoin-resources.com, also by Dare Gigi. Uh, you know, obviously he recommends reading the Bitcoin Standard and the bullish case for Bitcoin. So you should go ahead and, and listen or read those two as well and then go through his list of articles uh, podcasts and more that he has um, this is a really deep rabbit hole it is 100 percent worth going down and i think learning about bitcoin is possibly one of the highest return on investment activities of all time because you can sit read a few books listen to some podcasts watch some videos and take out your laptop and get an unbelievable education in economics, money, politics, um, computer science, and you will be able to sit there for yourself and, and make that decision if you want to um, kind of hold Bitcoin, if, if this is something that you can see uh, taking the world by storm and being an exponential technology and being adopted. Um, you can do that and it's all free and everyone out there who is working on Bitcoin and thinking about Bitcoin um, wants to help everyone else get on the same page as well so um, take the time this summer to really buckle down and, uh, and jump down the rabbit hole as far down as you can go I, I guarantee you it will be fun exciting and uh, very worthwhile in a few years all right, everybody. So don't forget to check out 21 Lessons. Uh, if you like this podcast, leave us a review. Shoot us a DM. Um, happy, to, happy to hear it and want to know what you guys want to hear from us. So this is CH from the Beef and Bitcoin podcast. All right. Have a good one.